I'm going to be speaking to you now about direct and inverse variation models. I put this joke right here because I thought it was hilarious and it actually sort of relates to this. Watch, an orchestra of 120 players takes 40 minutes to play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Symphony. How long would it take for 60 players to play it? <laughs> We're almost implying that you can do it faster, but of course that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's why I love this example. You don't want to play it faster, it's so dumb. <laughs> Uh, it's all about ratios. All right, so if we have direct variation, what does that mean? Well, that means if we have something like a y, if we say it's direct variation, it could be like y is proportional to x. So this symbol right here, maybe I'll write it like this, this means proportional to. Now, what does that even mean? Whoops, I can't seem to spell. Proportional to. What does that really mean? It means that well, y equals some constant. Like, you know, we could write it instead of proportional to, we can say y equals some number, some constant, times x. We just don't know what that k is. So a more generic way to do a direct variation is actually to say f of x, we'll do it like this, we'll say equals some constant. Now, uh, the IB likes to use the letter a, but it could be any constant. It could be, it could be k, it could be anything, right? Times x to the n. This is a generic form of a direct variation. That's it. I mean, this is just a, this, uh, maybe I'll label it here. This A right here is just a constant of proportionality. So maybe you need to find it, but maybe you don't. This is the key here. Okay, so proportionality. All right, so maybe you need to find A. Inverse variation, well, how does that work? Well, we could say this is proportional to 1 over x, something like this. So we could write it like this instead. So just, just like we did it before, like this, let's do f of x equals, well, there's going to be some constant, we'll call it a, over x, but we can make it to the power of n. It can be whatever we want it to be. So something like this. But remember, if we divide by x, remember we're going to have something special happen here? Remember that if we divide by x, what if we make x equal to 0? I mean, normally we're not allowed to make it zero. So because x can't be zero, what happens if I make x zero? Well, I divide by zero, and that means I get an answer of infinity. You can't do that. In fact, this is how we define a vertical asymptote. Maybe you remember that from other videos we did. So a vertical asymptote. There we go. So the vertical asymptote will just be at x equals zero. Okay, so we'll set the VA is at x equals zero. That'll be an important thing, I guess. Uh, maybe I'll put in red here. Let's take a look at what a graph would look like. Well, if it's a graph that has a vertical asymptote, it's probably something like, uh, here, let me first put my x and my y, and then I'll try to draw something that goes like, uh, well, one over x, if I just made n1, very simple, uh, the graph of one over x just goes like, like this. And this one has a horizontal and a vertical asymptote in this case, but the important part is this one right here, this right here is your vertical vertical asymptote. See, x equals zero. That's good, right at zero, that's when it's a vertical asymptote. All right, how are we gonna use this? Because this seems simple, but examples sometimes aren't so simple. So let's do an example with 5G, since that's uh, at least in the news at the time that I record this, people are freaking out about this. Some people are actually tearing down 5G towers because they're worried about it. 5G radiation, it's just light. And light behaves the same way, at least as far as its um, intensity. That's why I like this one. I don't feel a thing. The man being bombarded by invisible rays. <laughs> like It looks like it's going right through his face. This is happening to you right now. You have radio waves. There's lots of things going right through you. You don't notice it. So 5G, there's nothing to worry about, um, and we'll see why. Because you'll see the uh, intensity of it, it, it varies inversely with the square of the distance. What does that really mean? Let's first of all just take that piece of information. The intensity, which is I, if it varies inversely, well, inverse variation, remember inverse variation then, that will be um, just something that's like this, proportional to 1 over, and the distance, which they defined as x here, we'll say x squared. Well, that's really like saying i equals some constant. I don't know what it is, some constant over x squared. Okay, this is sort of my generic equation for it. Now, I don't know what co the constant is. I don't know what that is. But I do know that it's going to be x squared. 
Now we have a, an example here where we have the intensity is 200 watts per meter squared. That's how we define intensity. At a distance of 10 meters away from a 5G tower, and what's the intensity at a distance of 40 meters? You might wonder, oh god, how do I do this? Do I have to find K? I mean, you could. You could actually go ahead and find K. I want to show you how you don't need to find K. And in fact, uh, if you take physics, I know the IB physics exams, they love to do things like this here to give you questions like this. They, would, they wouldn't even, uh, they would just define it as I. They'd see an intensity, it's just called I at a distance of 50 meters away. What happens if you're at 40 meters away? You'd have to do like some fraction of I. But I'll just show you how to generically do it, okay? You could actually go ahead and figure out K. I'm going to try to show you how you don't need it. So I'm going to write myself an equation for I1, like the initial one. Well, I1 is just going to be some constant over x1 squared. And I have some I2, some second intensity, just going to be that same constant over x2 squared. What I like to do is whenever I have a situation like this, I call these ratio questions because I have a set of conditions, and now I have a new set of conditions. What happens? So I like to say... Um, you know, do the new thing over the old thing is usually how I say it in physics at least. I'm going to do I2. I'm going to make this whole equation. So I2, which is k over x2 squared, I'm going to divide that whole thing by I1 equation, which is k over x1 squared. Now, do you remember what happens when you divide a fraction by a fraction? Because by the way, you can divide a whole equation by a whole equation. That's okay. You can do that. So I'm just taking the new thing divided by the old thing. So new over old. Maybe I'll call it that. So I'll say, all right, so it's like the, the new condition. So sort of, I could say new over old. This is how, at least in physics, I like to define it like that. Um, okay, so let's see if we can do this. We can just uh, divide this. What happens when you divide a fraction by a fraction? Well, you have to multiply by the reciprocal. So you flip this one and multiply it. So let's keep going then. So I have I2 over i1. That must be equal, let's see, it's k over x2 squared. By the way, if you're really experienced in this, you won't bother with these. You'll cancel things out right away. I'm just trying to show you what to do if you don't know what you're doing. This k over x1 squared gets flipped, so it becomes x1 squared over k. Good news, k over k, they cancel out, so we didn't need to find it. That's the whole reason I tried to avoid it. I didn't even need to find it. So I could then state that i 2 over i1 must be equal to, let's see, x1 over x2. Right? This is x1 over x2, and they're both squared, so I can actually go like this instead. Now the good news is, now I'm ready. I'm ready to go for everything I need. Let's just uh, plug in all the different letters here. This one right here is actually i1. That's the initial. This right here must be then x1. This, by definition then must be x2. Let's just put in all the values and away I go. So I'm going to have i2 over i1 and by the way, um, actually you know what I'll do? I'll, uh, yeah, I'll just say it's over 200. Now you know what I'm going to do? No, never mind. I'm not going to do it yet. I'm going to leave it like this. I just want to show you how you do generically it's more powerful to do it this way. x2 over x1, uh, sorry, x1 over x2. x1 is 10, x2 is 40 right? and all that is squared. How can I deal with that? I can keep going. Let's see, that gives me, um, well, I have 10 over 40 is the same thing as 1 over 4 squared, right? because they, they both just divide by 10. And if I do that, well, 1 squared is just 1, and 4 squared is 16. So if I want to solve for i2, I could say that i2, um, now you might wonder why is he doing it so convoluted. You can do it in simpler ways. I'm just trying to show you a generic way to show you this. So if I want to get i2 by itself, I say it's going to be um, i1 over 16. So in other words, it's 1 16th what it used to be. Now let's, let's put in the actual numbers just to make sure this makes sense here. Because you could have put in the numbers initially here. That would have been fine. So i2 equals, let's see, i1, which was 200 over 16. Let's do that on my calculator. 200 over 16. Let's see here. 200 divided by 16 and say approximately equal to is 12.5. So it's 12.5 watts per meter squared. That's my new intensity. So do you see how we did this? 
So that is my new intensity. And keep in mind, it's 16 times less powerful. So what does that mean? That means you don't have to worry about 5G radiation uh, as long as you're any distance away. So as you travel further away, the intensity of light goes down. This, by the way, is the same thing with all light. All light does this. That's why, like, if you're driving in a, you know, in a car and someone has their brights on at night, you know, and it's really, really bright, but when they're further away, it's not so bright at all. This is why. Because we have this intensity goes down uh, with the square of the distance. So that means if something gets twice as far away, well, it's 1 over 2 squared, so 1 over 4 times as powerful. If something goes you know, 4 times further away, then it's 16 times less powerful, and so on. You just have to square it. If you're 10 times away, then it's 100 times less powerful, and so on. Now, why should you care? I mean, economics and supply and demand uses this. We have, actually, in chemistry, we have some really cool things. Uh, we have something called Charles Law, for example. Uh, Charles Law, it's also in physics, by the way. Um, what does that say? That says that, uh, I mean, it, we can define it with a constant uh, pressure, but we can say that the velocity is, it's not velocity, volume is proportional to the temperature. So that tells us actually that, uh, you know, hot gases expand. That's actually kind of nice to know. That's because, you know, as V, as T goes up, V goes up. See, because they're directly proportional. Well, Boyle's Law, uh, that one, it says actually that the, um, let's see, we can see the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure, if we keep a constant temperature, of course. But uh, So what this means is that if pressure goes down, the volume goes up. If the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. Whereas here, if we said the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. If the temperature goes down, the volume goes down. See, so this one goes directly. Whatever T does, V does. But here, whatever the pressure does, it's inverse. By the way, physics, we just saw this, right? There's lots of things in physics. Now, why did I put this picture here? Well, that's because uh, when I was in the Air Force, I was training to be air crew, and anybody who's going to be in an airplane has to have this kind of training. So what they do is they put you into this room just like this, and everyone's wearing oxygen masks for a very specific reason. What they want to do, they want to simulate high altitude. To do that, they want to remove air. When they remove air, they remove or they lower the air pressure. So do you notice then what happens? As they lower the pressure, or sorry, yeah, as they remove air from this room, then they lower the pressure. That's also why you need oxygen masks to breathe, or else you know your brain doesn't do very well without oxygen. So as they remove the oxygen, you're still breathing, so you're still fine. But they remove the oxygen in the room, and what happens then? Well, the pressure goes down. And if the pressure goes down, the volume of gases goes up. That means if you had a balloon uh, that was actually blown up, okay, so you had a you know an actual balloon that's blown up in this room when we did this, as they remove the air, the pressure goes down, which means the volume actually expands. Now I have a very real, uh, very visceral reaction to this because when I first went into this pressure chamber, I remember thinking, oh God, this place, it smells like farts. It smells like someone just like had an accident in their pants. And so the real reason why that happened is, imagine then I'm sitting in this room, we put our oxygen masks on, they remove the air, at least a lot of it, and because of that, the pressure goes down. Well, remember I said the volume goes up. You have a bunch of gases in you, don't you? You have gases in your lungs and in your stomach. And those gases want to go out immediately. So as soon as they were <laughs> removing the air, as soon as the pressure is going down, those gases want to escape. <laughs> so they come out. So you do a huge burp, a gigantic fart. So I was like, oh, now I know why this room smells so bad. So it actually explains why pressure chambers smell so bad. Uh, by contrast, though, it's also something that's inverse to this as well, which means um, like if you go really deep under the water, you know, you feel that the pressure is actually a lot. Well, as pressure goes up, volume goes down. That's why things like under the water, things get squished. So, uh, for example, submarines, if they go too deep, we call it a crush depth. That's because the pressure is so, so big and the volume is so, so small. I mean, it wants to make your volume small. So if you're a submarine, it wants to squish the submarine. That's why submarines can't go too deep unless they're very specially made. So hopefully this explains a little bit some practical reasons and practical uses of direct and inverse variation.